Well, good morning. I'll steal a line from the movie Jaws. We're going to need a bigger stadium. Hey, uh, it, is, it is such a great time to be together, and I just want to say a special thanks uh, to the Meridian School District and to Webster Kurz, who was here at 4 a.m. to turn on the lights so we could set up. And for our, our tech guys uh, that were here at 4 a.m. setting this up, uh, yeah, it's amazing. And... Uh, Romano and his team here bringing in the sound system so much, and our, our worship team for doing this, our, our parking and the uh, hospitality, I mean, just all that. And, and thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being a church that allows us to try something new and crazy and uh, to do that. So glad that you're here. And um, I'm excited because for some of you, you're getting to experience right now what I grew up with, hard benches. Some of you don't know anything but padded chairs. You're soft. How many of you had wooden pews growing up? Yeah. And how many had them a.m. and p.m. on Sunday? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, now you, you understand what I'm talking about. And Krispy Kreme donuts. We had to rifle through our mom's purses looking for mints in the bottom with lint all over them. And you only laugh because it's true. And you know that. But it is good to have you here and those of you standing here, those of you over there in the, in the seating in the overflow section, we see you over there in the, in the uh, picnic tables and the other bleachers. Good to have you guys over there. They're having a party. I think they got lunch served already. So that's nice. It's good to be able to be here and to be in this, in this setting and uh, to be here like in an athletic setting. I mean, you got the gridiron behind you where where. Uh, football and soccer is played, you got baseball, you got softball, all these things, but we're here on the track. And, and I thought about that as we were preparing for this, uh, this weekend, thinking about being set up here on the track and how often throughout Scripture, especially in the New Testament, our walk with Christ, our journey through life in Christ is related to this idea of running a race. It's this picture, this metaphor, this imagery of running races. And Paul does this all the time. Now, I wonder, I don't think that Paul was necessarily a runner. Maybe he was, but he was definitely familiar with running and he was familiar with races. I mean, you know, you know that on his missionary journeys, he spent some time in Greece. And Greece was like the, the, the heartbeat of, of athletic uh, competition. The Olympics were held there every four years. I mean, the ancient Olympics started in 776 BC and ran for five or 600 years. They understood. And the Olympic Games were more than just an athletic competition. For the Greeks, the Olympic Games were not only an athletic competition, they were a religious experience as well because the Olympic Games were run, were wrestled, were, were done in honor of and in the, for the glory of Zeus. And when Paul comes along talking about this life that's like, a, like this competition, he understands it's not just the competition, but it's a religious experience too. But it's not for Zeus, it's for Jesus. And in Acts, he writes, he says this thing in Acts chapter 20, verse 24, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may, listen to this, finish the race, finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given to me. He saw that his running with Christ was like this race and he did it not for, for some Greek God, but he did it for the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the one who had redeemed him, the one who had given him grace, the ones that made him alive. And he said, I run for this. And later, um, he spent some time in Corinth. And second only to the Olympic Games was a thing called the Isthmian Games that happened every other year. And here's an interesting thing. These games were done in the honor of the, the sea god Poseidon. And they happen every other year. In the year 51 AD, AD 51, in the spring, the Isthmian Games took place in Corinth. Scholars will tell you that in the year AD 51, Paul was in Corinth. He was there when these games were taking place, and many would speculate that he was building tents or making tents for the vendors and for some of the athletes during these games. And so he understood, and this is why he would use this imagery of competition of running, especially in Corinth, because in Corinth, they understood athletics. It's like going to the Skagit Valley and talking about tulips. You just get it. <laughs> going to Linden and talking about raspberries. 
So I'm, I'm playing it safe today. It's going to Darrington and talking about bluegrass. Okay, well, let's stick with that one. When you're in Corinth and you talk about athletics, they get it. So when he writes a letter to these followers of Christ in Corinth, he uses the imagery again. He uses the metaphor in 1 Corinthians 9. He says, do you not know that in a race all the runners run? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who c competes in the games, when he says in the games, they know exactly what he's talking about. He's talking about the Isthmian games. It happens there. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a prize that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. And then he says, therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. And he's not talking about physically running. At this point, he's talking about his life, his calling, that he wants to be very intentional, very purposeful, not just kind of trying to make it through, but doing this for Christ. And years later, he would write to young Timothy and he would say these words as he knows he's coming to the end of his life. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And my prayer for us as followers of Jesus is that we would run our lives, that we would live our lives very intentionally and very purposefully, and that there would come a day when we would be able to say, I have fought the good fight, and I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. So today, for just a few minutes, and, and Someone asked me, since you're only preaching once this weekend, are you preaching three times as long? Amen. Thank you. Thank you. No. But for a few minutes, for a few minutes, what I want to do is look at a, a very familiar passage of Scripture that takes this imagery, this metaphor of running our, our race of our life and and I don't know if it's a sermon as much as just talking about this life and this race and some running that I've done. I mean, I, I, and when I turned 35, I became a runner and, and fell in love with it. Up to that point, I hated it, but have run since then. And just talk about some running and how that relates to our life. And the verses are actually on the handout, on the page where you can't read any of the words at the top. See, if you're over, if you're over 40, you couldn't read any of those words. But at the top, there's this passage out of Hebrews chapter 12. And I, wanna, I want us to just kind of walk through this. And he starts off and he says, um, he says, therefore, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Now, you don't start a sentence with therefore. That's not the beginning. That's a, that's a bridge statement. That's a conjunction, junction. That's, that's something that connects two things. This happens Therefore, this is the deal. Because of this, therefore, we have this. So he's talking about something else that, that he doesn't just start. So we're picking up mid-sentence, mid-thought, mid-understanding mid of something before this. And he's kind of talking about this great cloud of witnesses. Years ago, I ran a, a marathon called the Avenue of the Giants. It's in Northern California. And the majority of the marathon, you're running through these beautiful redwood trees that are hundreds and literally thousands of years old. And that's why they call it the Avenue of the Giants, because as you run, and it's inspiring as you're running by to see these trees that have weathered storms, that have endured for hundreds and hundreds of years, that have seen droughts and wind and all kinds of things. And, and some of them were, were maybe just little seedlings when Jesus walked in Jerusalem, that, that these trees are there and they stand as a silent witness cheering you on. And in, in Hebrews chapter 11 the writer of Hebrews gives this picture of this avenue of giants, but they're not redwood trees. They're people who have walked, the people who have run their race, the people who have lived a life of faith, and they stand as silent witnesses, cheering you on, inspiring you in your race. And he goes through, and it's not an exhaustive list, but if you read through Hebrews chapter 11, you see it's, it's this uh, composite of, of men and women who lived a life of faith, and God did incredible things, incredible victories. And then at the end, he says, but they weren't always easy lives. In fact, some of them didn't get the victories. In fact, some of them had some very difficult hardships that they went through. Losses, struggles, the prayers didn't get answered. Those things that were promised didn't get fulfilled yet. And yet they remained faithful. And he says, and when you keep those people in mind that have run this race before, their life inspires you. Their example cheers you on. So he says, therefore, you know, 
with this great cloud of witnesses. And then he gives us kind of this race strategy. Three times he'll say, let us, th therefore, let us do this. And the let us idea is not a command as much as it is an invitation. Hey, let's do this. It's like a coach saying, I want to give you the strategy for how to run your best race, for how to finish strong, to how to be able to say at the end, I've, I've kept the faith, I, I've finished the race. And he gives these pictures three times of, of different things. And I love when he says, let us, because he's not saying you ought to. He's saying, you're not in this race alone. Not only throughout history do you have this great cloud of witnesses, but around you, you have a great cloud of witnesses. You have others that are running this race, and he includes himself. So he says, he says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us. When you're running this race, there's some things that are going to hold you back. There's some things that are going to restrict your emotion. There's some things that will slow you down, trip you up, and take you out. So let's get rid of those things. Now you can imagine he's talking to people that understand this because they wear togas and robes and tunics. And a toga may have been great for your party in the 80s, but it's not great when you're running a race because it's going to slow you down. He says, and these things that will hinder you, these things that will keep you back and the sin, let's get rid of that. Some of you were with us throughout the summer as we studied the, the letter to the Colossian church. And three weeks ago, we looked at this passage where he says, there are some things in our life from our past we need to put to death. There are some things that we used to have that we need to get rid of. There are some things that, that was before, but this is now. That's the old, but we put on the new. And likewise, he's saying there's some stuff that if you're going to run this race with Christ, there's some th stuff that needs to be thrown away. It's taken off because it's going to trip you up. I mean, in Galatians, Paul would talk about these things, that the acts of the sinful nature, like how we used to live. They're obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, and drunkenness, orgies, and the like. If you're wondering about that list, Galatians chapter 5, you can look it up on your own. But he says, those, 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 that's not how we live, not as followers after Christ. That we are getting rid of these things. That we are shedding these things so that we can run our race. I think it's not just the sin, but sometimes the thing that hinders us, sometimes the thing that restricts us, that trips us up, is what happens because of the sin. The guilt that we carry around. The regret. The shame, the doubts, the voices that we hear, God doesn't really love you. You couldn't really be used by him. You messed up too bad. And those things will trip us up as well. You remember what Paul said in Philippians 3? He says, not that I've already obtained all this or I've already been made perfect, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal. Get rid of those things. And the most beautiful picture of this to me is when Jesus encounters this woman who has a, a less than godly past. She's been married a bunch of times. She's living with the guy. She's got all this. Oh, wrong story. Different lady. This lady got caught in the very act of adultery. And they're brought with all this judgment and all this condemnation. And, and Jesus sends them all away. And she says, and he says to her, where are your accusers? And she says they're gone. And Jesus, the Holy One, the only one who's without sin, says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Like, get rid of that. You're free from that. I've forgiven you. Now run your race. And don't look back and don't live with regrets and don't live with your shame. I've taken care of that on the cross. Now go and run this race. So he says, so let us throw these things. And then he says, and let us run. Let us run with perseverance, the race marked out before us. You know, the word perseverance kind of implies this isn't a sprint. A perseverance means it's going to be a long run. It's going to be a long race. And there's going to be some times where it gets difficult. Times when you get tired. Times when you may get weary and discouraged, feel like quitting, feel like giving up. Feel like saying, is it worth it? He says, we run with perseverance. Now, again, we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews, but probably... For the people in the Mediterranean area, they understood this as well. There was a category of professional runners called hemorrhodromos. And a hemorrhodromos literally translated means all day runner. They were couriers, 
because they didn't have, you know, texting or, or telegrams or anything. They would use these couriers and these, these guys would run and they were all day runners. They would run and run and run. The most famous one is a guy named, named Pheidippides. You may have heard of Pheidippides. You may have heard about him. When the, the battle was won in Marathon, they gave him the message to run back to Athens and tell them we have gotten the victory. Pheidippides, this all day runner, takes the message, runs all the way back to Athens, says, victory, we win, and then he dies. That's why we run marathons. <laughs> the true story is he probably ran about another 250 miles the two days before that, before he died. So regardless, but he runs with perseverance. So when he says to them, we're running this race, it's going to be long and there's going to be times where we get tired, but we continue on. We continue to run with perseverance. Last October, I was running the Portland Marathon and at the starting area, you, you kind of, uh, Put yourself into corrals or categories based on the kind of time that you think you'll run this race. And I was in this category, and there was a, a young, younger man, younger than me anyway, much younger than me, probably less than half my age. Uh, um, <laughs> there was this kid. Um, <laughs> and he was there, and, and he was just all excited. And I'm, I'm excited too, but you know, I've just done this a few times. He's all excited, and he's selfie in and doing all this. And, and I'm thinking, I look at this, and I just watch, and seeing the way he's dressed, I'm thinking, I bet this is his first marathon. I mean, he's got the Portland Marathon hat, the Portland Marathon shirt, the Portland Marathon socks. I mean, he is full on. And the way he's layered, he's got way too much clothes on. It's going to get hot. I'm thinking he didn't. Uh. So finally, I said, hey, do you want me to take your picture? And he says, yeah. So I take his picture. And so I, I introduced myself. He says, my name's Parker. I said, Parker, great. He goes, hey, how many, how many times have you run a marathon? And I said, this one or all together? And he said, who needs notes? Uh, <laughs> I'm going to preach all day now. <laughs> Maybe someone could help me out there. Thanks. <laughs> so Parker says, uh, how many of you run? So I, I tell him and I, I said, how about you? He goes, this is my first one. I said, you're not, you're not kidding me, are you? <laughs> so the race starts. Thanks, Jerry. <laughs> Does that go over my mouth? So the race starts and Parker takes off and, it, and uh, takes off way faster than I am. And we had this goal to run about the same amount of time and away he goes and I'm like, good on him. Three hours later, about mile 19, mile 20, I see a guy up ahead of me walking. It's Parker. And I'm like, he jumped out a little too fast and he's a little too hot right now. So as I came up and I said, hey, Parker, Whatever you do, don't stop. Don't quit. You don't have to run if you can't, but you do not stop. And I said, you're doing it great and you're gonna make it. And I kept running and I finished my race. Well, afterwards I, I left and, and then I got to wonder, I wonder how Parker did. So I got on the, on the Portland Marathon website and I didn't even know his last name with the race resorts. And I'm thinking, how many guys are there named Parker? So I just started going through. And sure enough, there was Parker. His goal was to run the marathon in four hours. He came in in five hours and 31 minutes, an hour and a half slower than he anticipated, but he did not quit. And there may be some of us who have set out to do all of these great things, and maybe there's some things that we've made some mistakes and some things that have kind of set us back, but we don't stop. Let us not become weary in doing well, well doing because at the proper time, God will reward us. So he says, so, so let's throw off some of the stuff that holds us back and, and let's run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. And let's fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Let's fix our eyes on him. Because when we get weary or when we get distracted by the crowd or we begin to look at all these other things, we can get off base. But if we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, we'll continue to run the race. Several years ago, and I don't say this in any way to brag, but I ran um, an ultra marathon in South Africa. It's, it's the world's oldest and biggest, not longest, but biggest uh, ultra marathon. It, it, actually, they ran it last night. It's called Comrades Marathon, 56 miles, and they have a very strict 12 hour cutoff. At 12 hours, if you're from here to the finish line and the 12 hours come, you don't finish. The South African national rugby team 
makes a barrier across the finish line, and the race director turns his back on the race, and it's over. And it doesn't matter if you're 10 feet away, you don't finish. Now contrast that with Jesus, who will never turn his back on you, who will never leave you or forsake you. Jesus, who is Emmanuel God with us, who runs with us. Jesus, the one who endured the cross for the joy set before him. He endured the cross, scorning its shame. While he's on the cross, Jesus has the Father turn his back towards him so that we would never have to experience that. So we fix our eyes on the one who loves us most, the one who gave us everything, the one who forgives us, the one who believes in us, the one who cheers for us, the joy, the joy set before him was you and I. That's why he would go to the cross. And he says, so when you get tired and when you get weary and when you begin to wonder, is it worth it? You think about what Jesus did. Think about what his love compelled him to do for you. And think about the fact that he is cheering for you. He has set an example for you. You fix your eyes on him so that you not, do not grow weary and give up. And he is the one that has promised to empower you and to walk with you and to enable you to continue on in this race. In Isaiah chapter 40, we read these words. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary. His understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. See, church, we're all in this together. And for some of you, you're fresh out of the starting blocks. And for some of you, you can almost see the finish line. And some of you right now have hit your stride and you are soaring on wings of eagles. And some of you have hit the wall and you're barely walking. But we're in this together. And we have a great cloud of witnesses, not only from the Bible and not only from history, sitting here right with us. I mean, just look around. That We're in this race together. So, let us get rid of the baggage that slows us down. The things that would, that would try to trip us up. And let us run with perseverance, even when it's one step at a time. And let us keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. So Paul writes these words, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. To be able to say one day, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And to come across that finish line and to see this great cloud of witnesses cheering you on and there above all the crowd is the Lord Jesus with a smile on his face saying, well done, well run, you did it, you finished. Jesus, I pray, I pray that we would run this race. God, I pray that we collectively would be the cloud of witnesses that encourages to exhort, to invite, to cheer one another on. And I pray that by the power of your spirit, we would live the life you've called and created us to live. That we would willingly put aside the old and put on the new. That we would throw off those things that hinder us and, and the sin that so easily entangles us. 
And God, every day, this day, tomorrow, every day, we would run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And throughout our lives, we would fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Jesus, because of us, that you would go to the cross so that we could live this life victoriously in the power of your spirit. So Lord, I pray that this day we would run that race to your glory by your grace. Pray in your name. Amen.